that's been around for a number of years. I've heard that probably 30, 40 times as young as I am. And uh, boy, it still ministers to the heart and challenges at the same time. I'll never forget when we had the hurricane, and some of you remember, we even shot some video as we had here just to what seems like forever ago, but yet not too long ago. And we had trees and limbs down all over the property. And I was watching that video, Brother Ben, not too recently ago. And there is, if you look here in the circle on your way out, you'll notice that there's a tree or what's left of a tree. And it stands, I don't know, about three, three and a half feet tall. And as pastors kind of shared what happened there, there's a cross carved in to where the stump of the tree is. And as I was going around in preparation for the cleanup venture for that time on that Saturday in preparation for church, I remember going around and I was videotaping with my phone um, all over to give people an idea of how things were here at the property. And I'll never forget when I got to that tree, I thought, wow, that's amazing that there were some trees that were uprooted and some that were kind of snapped in half, but this one kind of caught my attention because it was a large tree, and a few feet out of the ground, it just snapped. The winds and everything that took place during that hurricane portion just really demolished it. But something that stood out to me was the fact that the root system held. The foundation stood firm. The ability to be rooted in the dirt, kept it staying firm. And although there was some damage and the tree fell over, I I thought that was very interesting and something that I believe we can learn tonight from Colossians chapter number 2, to be rooted in Christ. We live in a day, we live in an age where people, teenagers, single adults, families are being uprooted. We live in a day where truth is relative. You look where what was once maybe some unity, where there was maybe some ability to get along, now it's constant strife and there's um, debate and all of these different things. We live in a day where people are just not grounded. They're just not rooted. And of like token, I believe that we live in an age of, as I said, relativity, and so many Christians are not rooted. They're not grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we today, as like a time like none other, we must be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to the church of Colossae. Now, Colossae was about a hundred miles inland from the city of Ephesus, which is, if you know your Bible, you know that the book of Ephesians was written to the Christians at um, Ephesus. And the book of Colossians was written to the church or the people at Colossae. And this place of Colossae was a place of trade. It was kind of a midway point between the east and the west. And this was also, to give you a little bit of a bearing, was about 12 miles south of the place of Laodicea that we learn about as one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And so these places, we understand that the Apostle Paul was not one who would have founded this church, we would understand, and many are led to believe that a man by the name of Epaphras was one who led many to Christ in the city of Colossae, and one that was the pastor of this local New Testament church. And I I thank God for local New Testament churches. That's the biblical model. Indigenous, self-governing churches. But this guy Epaphras, as we understand through the writing of the book of Colossae, there was some difficulties. There were some problems there in the church, and I don't believe there's a living church out there that doesn't have some struggles, that doesn't have some problems. Why? Because there's people in the church, and we cause problems, you know. And so it was at this church, and this, guy, this man, Epaphras, who no doubt loved the people there at Colossae, as our pastor loves the people here at Volusia County Baptist Church, He was not sure what to do. He was pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ, but some that had turned to the Lord Jesus Christ were planted and engrafted into the body of Christ, were being drawn away by diverse lusts and other ideologies and philosophies. And so this 
man Epaphras makes what would be approximately a thousand mile round trip journey to go see the Apostle Paul at the Mamertine prison in Rome. And there when he meets with the Apostle Paul, and what does it mean for someone to be an apostle? Someone who saw physically with their own eyes the risen Lord. And so this man, he comes to the Apostle Paul there at prison, who would have been chained to the Praetorian guards there in Rome. He comes to the Apostle Paul and he bears his heart and he begins sharing some of the struggles that are going on. And he sends back with this man Epaphras this letter to the church at Colossae, encouraging them. And in chapter number 2, I want you to look here with me. We'll start in verse number 4. He says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the face, faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And the phrase that he says there in verse number 6, in the beginning of verse 7, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening and for this lighthouse of Volusia County Baptist Church, what you're doing through this church. I thank you for the people that you've planted and placed into this place. I thank you for the ministry that I had the privilege to be a part of here. But Father, I pray that we would be a body of believers that are rooted, that are grounded, that are fixed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, it's not about a denomination but it's about a Savior tonight. And I pray that that would be our heart's cry. That would be what we are founded in tonight. Help each one of us to come with an open heart and a clear mind and say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do tonight? Help us not to sit here and say, well, let me check Mark, but Father, would you help us to come and say, what do I need to change? What adjustments, what tweaks do I need in my heart, Father? Father, give me the exact words to say. Help me not be an obstacle, but help me to be an instrument tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look tonight at three simple ways to be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first we find in verse number 6. He says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. First we must be rooted personally tonight, rooted personally. And the very understanding here is that for someone to be rooted, you must first be planted. And I don't know your spiritual state here tonight. I don't know what family you come from, but it matters not what physical family, but what simply matters tonight is the spiritual family. It matters who your spiritual father is tonight. You know, I deal with teenagers on a weekly basis, and I shared with them 1 John 5, 12, and I said, the crux of the issue of all of eternity is simply this point, and it's this, he that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son hath not life. And I said, teenagers, I cannot put it in any simpler, I cannot put it any clearer than this. And teenagers, I hope tonight that we're taking notes and I was tempted to bring each one of them and set them right here. I thought about it. And so you mess up tonight, don't worry. Next time we'll put you right down on the front row. But I thank God for our teenagers and we have a new program that we initiated. Some of you may see them carrying around a little binder. It says cross trainers. Well, this is a program that uh, through some prayer and direction of the Lord and some guidance and some great wisdom um, from Pastor and from Brother Les Rawl, it's something just to simply encourage them to go forward for Christ, taking notes and bringing their Bible to church. You'd think that's a given, but not necessarily in today's world. Being involved in outreach, being involved in ministries. They have a ministry sheet, and so like Brother Tony back there and Miss Lisa, they have to sign off if someone's in there, and we give them points for that, and there's some things we're going to be doing, such as a retreat and a conference in April and various things. We're excited about that. But I thank God for our... our Youth ministry, our uh, children's ministry, all of the workers that make that happen. Boy, it takes a lot of people. And with these teenagers, some 
come from a background, and you may be like this, that some walk in, they, they come from the background of, well, I am going to work to try to get there as best I can. Others walk in from a religious estimation of how good that they have been, some things that they have done, a system that they've been involved in. And then yet there are still some others who come in and say, number one, I don't know if there is a God. I have not necessarily seen evidence. Or number two, I simply reject the notion and the idea of God altogether. And we get all three on a weekly basis. And so I shared with them that that is the crux of the issue. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 4 says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all saints. He says the faith in Christ Jesus. It's the issue of our faith. But I, I, I find it very interesting that at the second half of that verse, listen to what he said. The faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. Well, that's something that people need to see today, isn't it? They need to see the love of Christ, not just to a select group of people. But when they come into this place, there ought to be an oozing. There ought to be an overabundance of this thing of the love of Christ. Far too often, the love from human to human can be seen from the secular crowd. But sometimes not the spiritual crowd, may I say. And I, I'll never forget, I was dealing with a, a lady and she was struggling with whether she was going to take her life or not. And she was talking about, you know, some some things that were going on in her life and some difficulties. I just can't handle it anymore. And I wonder how many times we're about our business, but sometimes we fail to be about our Father's business. They were just a little too busy. They were just a little bit too preoccupied. There ought to be a love that's found in us, and they, they ought to walk in here and say, wow, these people really love each other. You know, they say family can fight the best, but boy... This family ought to love the best. Don't you agree? You know, this whole thing of someone being rooted initializes with being saved, being planted. Someone once said this, Every saved person this side of heaven owes the gospel to every unsaved person this side of hell. May I say that again? Every saved person on this side of heaven owes the gospel to every unsaved person on this side of hell. May I ask you, when was the last time that you looked out and you said, wow, that person, these people need the Lord? Brother Bob sang about it. Boy, we can sit, sit there and say, amen, yes. But when we leave the confines of this pep rally, spiritual pep rally, if you will, when we leave the confines, what is the primary concern of our heart and the overwhelming theme of our thoughts? You see, this program that the Lord directed pastor in each one reach one, I love the theme. Sometimes we go, Boy, there's a great need, and I hope some people will fill that need. But sometimes we love to look at the majesticness of the problem, but far too often we fail to personalize it in our own life. I'm thankful, though, that this is a church that reaches out to our community. This is a place where the gospel is regularly preached and proclaimed. Someone that is rooted personally is not only saved, but secondly, they're sustained. They're sustained. George Mueller said this, the first thing I must do is to fellowship with the Lord. You know, for some, some plants that are growing and they're rooting, they're taking root, there was a continual growth process. Yes, you start with the planting, but the planting is sustained by being fed water, by being fed nutrients, and that's how the roots begin to take depth in the soil, is because it takes the nutrients, it takes the necessities to be able to take root. And my friend, if you're not getting the spiritual nutrients 
of the Word of God, from the Spirit of God. That may be why it seems like the winds of this world blow you to and fro. James chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Well, we want so many things instant, don't we? There's something I read. It told about a, a comedian who came from Russia to the United States, and he wasn't at that time prepared for all of the instant articles that we had. He said this, that on my first shopping trip, I saw powdered milk, and all that you added was water, and you got milk. And then I saw powdered orange juice. You just add water, and you got orange juice. He said, and then I saw baby powder, and I thought to myself, wow, what a country. <laughs> and sometimes you go... Is there any end to this instant society? And boy, wouldn't that be something, Brother Jim? I thought on that. I just had to share that with you tonight. But you know, we live in an instant society. We live in the fast food. Have it your way. It just pop it in the microwave, and there you are. But if it doesn't fit in the microwave, then we, I don't have time, or I don't have use for it, then I give it to my wife. My wife... Uh, she says, I can always tell when you've attempted to cook something. I said, how? She said, because on the top of the stove, there's all this burnt water or some other type of fluid that's burnt, and I walk in and I smell, something's burned. <laughs> I don't do it. Amen. Can I get a witness? It's kind of how it works for me. I used to, as a child, get into this whole thing. And I love to watch Food Network, but I, I'm, I'm no emerald. Rooted personally. May I ask you tonight, are you rooted personally? So many times we like to think of the message from the Word of God and particularly the message of the Gospel as something that's good, something that people should accept. But how often is the message of the Word of God looked at in a corporate, in a public fashion, but not personally? Rooted personally and secondly... Rooted doctrinally. Look here with me in verse number 7. The apostle writes here, Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Someone who is rooted doctrinally is, number one, established. You are established in the word. When I was in California... I was there in the high desert of Palmdale, Lancaster, and the, the college there was in Lancaster, California, the high Sierra Desert and the, of the Antelope Valley. And there we had some things called tumbleweeds, and some of you have experienced that, seen that. Some of us have almost been toppled over by them. And such was my experience in college. I'll never forget I was out there walking in the parking lot, and all of a sudden, I kid you not, a six-and-a-half-foot-tall tumbleweed was rolling my way, Jacob. And I said, oh, my. I th at first, I thought, let me see if I can catch this thing. But it was moving, I don't know, about four or five miles an hour with the wind. And I said, I think I'm just going to step out of the way of this thing. And it just kept rolling, rolling, rolling. Raw high. Okay. So <laughs> it was incredible how the tumbleweed works, and sometimes I'd go, I'd be there, or go out for a walk in the, in the middle of the desert, and it was peaceful. I enjoyed those kind of times, and you'd watch tumbleweed after tumbleweed just kind of go on by, depending on the strength of the wind. But you know, there are an awful lot of Christians that I would say are tumbleweed Christians. Boy, they, they take root, but they don't become established in the roots of the Word of God and the doctrines of the Word of God. They're there, but then someone comes along on a television program. Someone comes along in the office, and they begin to share some thoughts, or they give them a little pamphlet, and they begin to get very confused because they've never gotten grounded and rooted in the doctrines of the Word of God. What is it that is doctrine? Doctrine is that which is right. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every 
wind of doctrine. You say, what is the Apostle Paul speaking of here? You see, in this place of Colossae, and also as we understand it, is in the city of Laodicea, you had Christians that had a heretical influence of doctrine there. And Paul writes this epistle, and as you look through the book of Colossians, you see some apologetics, you see some uh, deity of Christ being infused here. Why? Because there were some heretical doctrines that came from paganism, Judaism, and also certain forms of Christianity that were skewed. And these different pagan elements were an early form of Gnosticism. And you say, what is Gnosticism? Well, it's a Greek philosophy that emphasized the pursuit of knowledge and the development of the mind. It rejected the notion that there was a divine creator of the universe. And the Greeks were all about knowledge and infusing what they could attain mentally. And this was an early form of it from the paganism. The Jewish element was legalistic in nature. It was about the do's and the don'ts. It was about the long list of the law. And they were beginning to infuse grace with the law. And yes, certainly both have their purpose. The law points us for our need of a Savior and the strength of grace. But when you begin to mix the two, you begin to have a problem. And you begin to dilute the doctrine of the grace of God. And then there was a Christian component that did not altogether deny Jesus Christ, but it began to dethrone Him. Did you catch that? It didn't deny Christ, but it dethroned Him. Oh, how there's so many things in life that doesn't deny or begin to say, the Lord Jesus Christ is not welcome at all, but it simply comes about in a subtle nature, just as we read in Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said. It comes about, and it doesn't kick him completely out of the throne room, but the ideology that takes Christ and dethrones him and puts something or someone else in the place on the throne of our heart and our life. And where the Lord Jesus Christ should be prominent and preeminent, something else goes in his place. And so this heretical doctrine began seeping in and it was influencing. And this was the state, this was the place wherein Epaphras was. He's going, I don't know what to do. There's the doctrine that's infusing into the church. And these babes in Christ are being torn asunder. And so he makes his plea to the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul, maybe you can help straighten this out because I'm kind of at my wits end. I'm looking for the Lord to help me. But maybe they'll listen to you since you have physically seen and spoken with the risen Lord. So the Apostle Paul begins to write under the inspiration. Very important, teenagers. Inspiration means what? God breathed. And under the inspiration, you see, why you make a big deal? Well, you know, there's a, a great number of people that think that the Bible is inaccurate, that it has fallacies, that it is not altogether true because of the fact that men penned it. And I've been trying to share with them that though men were the instruments, they were not the authors. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul began to write this letter to the church and the Christians at Colossae and begin to such as he did in Colossians 1.16. He said, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. And verse 17, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All throughout the book of Colossians and Ephesians, you see doctrine. And here you see the deity or the Godhead of Christ infused, saying, Jesus Christ was not just a good man. He was the God-man. And he begins to encourage these people. And you say, wow, that seems like an awful lot of rhetoric tonight. Well, I want to share a few statistics from Gallup polls and from the Barna Research Group. 40% of Christians, get this, 40% of Christians said that Satan is not a living being, but a symbol of evil. More than 20% of Christians believe the Bible is not accurate in all of the principles that it teaches while 22% of Christians believe the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon are simply different expressions of the same truth. 
And this was updated recently in 2017. More than half of Christians agreed that Jesus Christ sinned while on earth. You say, you're getting worked up about an awful lot. No, I'm not getting worked up because we have teenagers in this room that are next door, that are being torn asunder, that are being uprooted by the satanic philosophies that he's infusing into this world and it's creeping into churches. You say... You're going to stand, you are absolutely right. Because if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm not even 30 years old, and so I can't imagine how some of you feel. Young people that were given the Word of God, young people that were in Master Club, that were in Patch the Pirate, that were at Awana, that had mom and dad that brought them to church. And then you say, they graduate. Where are they? Where are they? We've lost the children. You know, I was speaking with someone this week, I believe it was Friday in the office, about how our church and some churches like ours is not the normal. You know, I, I had the privilege of getting to go with some missionary friends of mine as I was a teenager growing up, and I began to see the deputation side of missions. And uh, Brother Paul, it really gave me a better insight and love for missionaries. And I was talking with someone this week about, man, boy, it really opened my eyes. You know, they don't get uh, love offering. They don't get fed. They don't get accommodations at an awful lot of churches when they go. They just say, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hope God blesses you. You know, there's an awful lot of churches, sad to say, that the term or the sign Ichabod could be placed over the doorpost. For the glory of the Lord is departed from here. And may it not be so at Volusia County Baptist Church. And as long as we, the people of God, place this first, we'll be just fine. You know, I, I point to our teenagers, and I'm sharing my heart with you tonight. Some of you aren't with us over there. I thank God for what he's doing in the hearts of teenagers, and um, I just, I'm just overjoyed with what he's doing. But I, I, I try to share with them in multiple facets the Word of God and the importance of it. I've told them time and time again, here's why I want you to have a Bible in your hand, because I don't want you to take what I say or maybe a potential typo on the screen, okay? That this is the Word of God. It's inspired. It's infallible. It's inerrant. It's preserved. And you can trust it. And I place this above a denomination. I place this above any man. Because God places great importance upon His Word. And so we look to it. We hold to it. We stand upon it. Someone that is rooted doctrinally is not only established, but they're taught. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You get that? He said, holding fast the faithful word. I'm so thankful, and may it never be said that we have failed to teach the Word of God, the doctrines of the Word of God. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to, them, to themselves teachers having itching ears. Boy, it just sounds like today, doesn't it? I'm reminded of a gentleman by the name of Rob Bell who had a, a church in Michigan, Mars Hill, and he wrote a very co controversial book entitled Love Wins and the premise of the book was all about the fact that the essence and the predominant attribute or characteristic of God was that of love, and he wouldn't dare send someone to hell. There was great debate, there was great outrage by so many men of God saying, this is heretical. Um, and then he soon thereafter left that and decided to go be the spiritual advisor for Oprah and there are so many different, what well, tells you an awful lot, doesn't it? But I'll stay off of that topic. Great, you know, you can have great talk shows, but just because you may be a nice person doesn't mean that you're following the will of God. But there are 
different individuals out there that want to just give that which is palatable. And I thank God for a man of God who doesn't simply share with us what we desire to hear, but what we need to hear. Some of you go, yeah, that's what a son should say about his dad. You know, I said the very same thing against a man, for a man, that I sat under for five years. And so this has nothing to do with my last name, just in case anybody's wondering. You know, I've seen this man weep over many. I've seen him cry. I've seen him completely broken for the love of this flock that God has entrusted to him as the under-shepherd. And I'm thankful that he stands here and he shares with us on a weekly basis things that we need. I'm so thankful for that. Never take that for granted. Because there's many of men, past, present, and there will be in the future, who, for sake of funding and fairness and everybody's desires, would skip over maybe some things that the Lord would direct them. I told the teenagers on Thursday night, I said, you know, sometimes people get upset with an evangelist, although they can't infuse their frustration on an evangelist because he blows in and then he blows back out and he's gone. <laughs> but they can oftentimes get upset sometimes and you say, wow, did somebody get upset today? No, no, that's not the reason why I'm sharing this. Uh, actually, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but I said... Uh, Whatever you say, okay? I'm just the dummy. No. I have a ventriloquist dummy, by the way, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. I used to be able to get away with saying things with the gym because it wasn't my mouth. I was having a dummy say it. I don't know how many people bought into that lie, but, you know, it was a great thought. You know, if, if we, the messenger, were solely a messenger for what it is that he tells us to say, and Sunday school teacher group leader, children's worker. Make sure that you're receiving direction from the Lord on what to say, what to teach. You say, well, I have curriculum. Well, you know, God can navigate and give some guidance even in some curriculum. He can. And I, I'm so thankful for our teachers. I look at Miss Jan and I, I think of so many others that are around here, for the Tom, um, for the Frank in the back and others. And teaching is a wonderful, necessary part, and I thank God for each of you. And may I say, that's where Sunday school comes in in such a wonderful way. You're able to, on a smaller level, small group level, connect with other people with fellowship, but diving into the Word of God. And one man said it this way, Sunday school was the church organized to fulfill the purpose of the church. So not only rooted personally and rooted doctrinally, but lastly, and we're done, rooted faithfully. Look here with me in verse number 5. The apostle writes, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Someone that is rooted and you're going to take true root. And I, I wish I had that picture of that tree out there, but some of you can envision it in your mind's eye. Where a portion of it stands and that which was connected to the root system going down in is where the strength came from. It didn't come from itself, but it came from the ground. It came from the depth of the root system. And someone who's going to be strong in the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to withstand the storms of this life the struggles that Satan throws, the darts, the temptations, is one that is going to not simply be planted. They're not simply going to be established, but they're faithfully going to be digging, diving, and feasting on the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to change them. Because, my friend, there are times that we may not enjoy being stretched. But, you know, if I may liken those times of stretching, of taking the roots and allowing them to take a deeper depth in your heart and in your life. Being rooted faithfully in the Word. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We must be faithful in the word. Another thing that we did with these teenagers is trying to encourage the cross trainers, which are our 9th through 12th grade group, of getting into the word of God on a daily basis. And we gave them a little binder. It has several things in it, but one of the things is a sheet 
that has two sides, and it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it's an encouraging thing when they come to me like they did in Sunday school today, and they show me their devotions for the gym, that they had been in the Word of God, and they had been dialed in. I'm excited tomorrow night for our Bible study with cross trainers at my house, and seeing as we go through the book of First Peter, you see, it's not solely about coming corporately, but it's about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ privately. Now, may I say, it's a wonderful thing to come here with the people of God. Forsake it not. It, we need this. We, you notice I called it a pep rally. Because if you come here, we can get excited. We can hear the, the preaching, the singing, and we can see someone that God's working in their life. Oh, wonderful. Amen. But where we're able to become rooted is when you open the Word of God for yourself. And God shows you something under the illumination of the Spirit of God that you'd never seen before. Someone else didn't cook it up, but the Holy Spirit in your heart through the Word of God showed you that you needed just for that day. Teenagers, don't neglect this time in your life. Don't take this time lightly. Don't take those devotions and burn through them on Saturday night so you can show them to us on Sunday morning. We cautioned them about that. And I said, we're going to read through. We're going to check. If we see that, done on that, those points. But it says, being faithful in the word, and as I already alluded to, faithfully in the church. Titus chapter 3 and verse 15. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Faithfully. Loving in the church. And then lastly, and we're done, laboring in the church. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For God is not unrighteous to, to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Boy, this is a working church. Sometimes it's kind of unfathomable of the amount of effort that goes into these next three months. <laughs> Around here, just on a regular basis, everybody takes a big gulp when you get up for that first announcement of journey through Christmas. <laughs> Some of you don't realize there have been meetings that have been going on for three, four months. Some of you know that. Some of you are new to the church. The first meeting I believe we had was, uh, Miss Kim's not in here, so she can't correct me. I, I'm guessing, Brother Steve, it was probably, was it March, the first time that the executive team met for Journey, I believe, March, April. And uh, periodically meeting, there's a big director's meeting tonight for each di head director of each segment. And what a tremendous amount of effort and work is going into a labor of love for Journey Through Christmas. And this time of people that are going to link arms and are going to go forward for the Lord Jesus Christ that they're not just saying, I'm just here to listen, I'm just here to receive, but I'm here to give, I'm here to serve. Boy, it's such a great part of being a church, being able to serve the Lord. And some of you, I'm excited to hear the stories. I'll never forget, <laughs> Brother Tony Brown, last year after Journey, we got to the end, and he was telling me, he said, man, I'm just so pumped about this, this is awesome. I've never done anything like this in my life. I can't wait for next year. I love his personality. He just, he excites me, charges my battery every time we talk. If you don't know Brother Tony, get to know the guy. He's great. And the kids love he and his wife and the workers there in junior church. And it's just the kind of ministry that Journey Through Christmas is. And it's a labor for sure. But boy, it's a labor of love. You know, there was once a, a farmer. They went to town to purchase seeds for his farm, and he, he got multiple types of seeds, and as he was on the way home, he had two different types of seeds that fell off, and one of those seeds was there, and it was a squash seed, and both of the seeds landed in some very fertile soil, and they both began to take root and begin to grow and um, germinate and all these things. Well, the squash, after a few days, you begin to see a little bit of a sprout, and after a few weeks, it began to grow more and more, and it just began to blossom. People were able to see the fruit very quickly. Then a few months, a few years went by, and that second seed that 
fell there into that good soil, began to take root, was an acorn. And many years later, it grew, rooted into a mighty oak tree. Sometimes you can have the flash in the pan, and some of you say, I, I'm maybe not like someone else. You say, what is it that I can do? I, I may not have some gifts like somebody else. Well, you can be faithful. I don't know whether you've been saved for two months or 20 years. But may I challenge you, may I encourage you tonight to take root in the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, boy, I've been taking root for 35 years. Amen. Well, you know, if you stop drawing nutrients, you stop, you stop drawing the necessities for life, you begin to die from the inside out. And maybe tonight's a good time for us to do some internal investigation in our own hearts. Maybe some of you tonight need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, God, I am committing to you tonight that I'm going to become rooted and established in the faith so that I may not be blown with every wind of doctrine. There's a lot out there. Some of you say, I need to be rooted in the Word of God faithfully in my life. But still yet, there may be someone in here tonight that as pastor talked so well this morning about having your eternal destiny settled. You say, wow, if I were to die tonight, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. And this whole thing of being rooted in Christ sounds wonderful. It sounds good. It sounds very spiritual. Oh, that's nice. But you see, there can be no root taking place if there was no seed planted in the soul. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I thank you for the Word of God. And I thank you for how you've stirred my heart, challenged me through this. I pray that in the next few moments that we would allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts tonight and see where we stand with you. See if maybe we're a little bit dry tonight. See if we need washing from the Word in our hearts and our lives.